From Off Script Media, I am Matthew Zachary, and this is Out of Patience. Now, if you went to the J.P. Morgan conference, you might have known this young woman because she came out on stage in a hospital gown to represent the voice and the face of the patient. She's got moxie. Dr. Jen Horanjeff, the founder and CEO of Savvy Co-op, is also a faculty member at Columbia Business School. She has a master's in ergonomics and biomechanics and a PhD in environmental medicine. She's the kind of person that always makes you feel like you're the dumbest guy in the room. She's an incredible human being. She's a really good friend of mine. And I was thrilled to sit down with her and have this phenomenal conversation. Enjoy. And wash your hands. S-A-A-V-Y or yeah, something? but don't tell people that. It'll put it in their brains. That is not the correct spelling. That is not the correct spelling. You should just register the domain misspelled. That's and true. then everyone can just go to, it'll redirect to the right one. Yeah, but I don't know that people are going to the wrong one. They just constantly spell it in emails and programs and brochures. <laughs> we'll mention the correct spelling of the company at the end of this episode. Please do. S- and we'll do it now as well. Yeah, S-A-V-V-Y. <laughs> Correct. Savvy. Savvy. Just well, as it's spelled. I was going to cue up uh, a birthday song, but uh, it's hard to build a birthday song for a brain <laughs> tumor benign anniversary celebration. But it's seven true. years today, which you proudly posted on LinkedIn, and you are un- you know, uh, uh, I'm not unexpectedly getting loads of accolade and recognition for something you didn't ask to be a anniversary in your life true true yes my seven-year brain surgery anniversary i think what was most compelling um obviously when i first met you and and learned about this whole story i I mentioned to you that when i started stupid cancer i wanted to make sure that the the ethos the brand the, the 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 purpose behind the community wasn't what you had it was the commonalities that we all shared when shit happened and when i put in there that benign tumors can be just as devastating as malignant tumors. It gave so much permission to people to know that it, that there was no judgments and no stigma. Because up until that point, there was, oh, you only had a benign tumor? Good for you. No, they can kill you too. You know, I appreciate you saying that. I know that I've connected with people in like the, the brain tumor community, and I feel as though... I don't necessarily belong like I kind of identify more with my other sort of diseases because I've been part of those communities. Right. I feel that I have more to maybe offer there. But I was nice to know that I did get the same sort of permission from those people that they said, no, you know, you're part of this, too. So this is your second time here. Welcome back. Thank you. And again, seven year brain anniversary. What triggered all this? What were your symptoms? Because I was misdiagnosed for six months and Fun fact of the day, they thought I originally had a benign brain tumor. Ah, there you go. Look at so that. So I thought I was out of the woods, even though I wasn't out of the woods, going back to this myth that benign brain tumors are, you'll be fine. Yeah. Well, for me, I mean, to back it up, I have so many other conditions that anything that's ever happened in my life, they always try to blame on something else. Right. So I was diagnosed with juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Because then tight. When I was an infant and several other autoimmune diseases that attack different parts of my body, one of them being called uveitis, which is a chronic eye disease. So it attacks my eyes. U-V-E-I-T-I-S. Uveitis. Right. So, so you have itis of the uvea. So yeah, inflammation. <laughs> Some people call it chronic iritis. Yes. So, you know, inflammation of the eye. And... Something that I've struggled with since I was a child. My eye has been really aggressive sometimes. So we talked about steroids last time I was on. Yes. Lots and lots of steroid drops in my eyeball. Lots of cataracts there. But at any rate, when I started to develop these headaches, suddenly it was 2009 that they thought it was perhaps my uveitis that was flared up because only when it gets really, really, really bad do I get symptoms. Usually I'm completely asymptomatic. But I was having this kind of like eye, facial, bone, headache, pain. Fun stuff, basically. Yeah, I was like, something's wrong. And naturally, as you can imagine, this presented itself on a Friday late afternoon. So therefore, I could not get in to see my ophthalmologist. Mm -hmm. So they sent me over to the ED. So I went to the hospital by me. I was living in California at the time. 
And I went there and naturally had to wait in the queue to be seen. And ultimately they did a CT and it was like late at night and they came back and they presented it so nonchalantly to me that I had a tumor and that I was going to have to follow up my PCP. Well, fun fact, as somebody with a thousand specialists, I did not even have a PCP. So I needed- Because you went right to the source yeah, and not to the yeah, sort of the circus tent. Like, so, yeah. I mean, long story short, I ended up seeing somebody getting referred elsewhere to a different academic hospital in California, was seen there, and they were prepared to operate. Uh, they were going to take it out then. But I was living in California at the time. I am from Boston. Uh, and my mother, if I can quote her, said, like hell, you're having surgery in California. You're going to come back to Boston to be seen. Right. And... I moved from California to Boston in four days. I was and <laughs> I was getting ready to move. Sounds like his own reality show. I know. Well, I was getting ready to move to New York for grad school, and that's what brought me here to New York. And so it just expedited my travels. I packed things up. I hopped in a car. A friend flew out, and we drove together cross country. My dad flew into Baltimore to make the final leg so that I could make my... 9 a.m. appointment in Boston that next Monday. It's like Death Race 2000. It was. It was <laughs> bananas. And so I was seen at MGH um, and Mass General Hospital. And it was there that they said that this is just under the size that they would operate on. And so we watched and waited. And the headaches went away. They resolved on their own eventually. And then it just chilled and hung out. And then the same thing happened, although the headaches were different. But they came back and... That was about four years afterwards. Where was your pain in, in your head? Because mine was like in the back left of my neck, which was not the typical migraine place. I'm like, yeah. my head shouldn't be hurting back here. Mine wasn't migraine. It, like, again, it was behind my eye the first right. time. The second time, it was kind of all over. And I got these horrible headaches when I would change levels. I, it was Christmas time, and I was in, at my family's house down in Georgia, my uncle's house. And I stay in the basement there. And going up the stairs, I could barely do it. I was grasping onto the rails because just changing elevation is what would trigger this wave of pain in my head. Right. And I took everything that I had to get on a plane and get to Boston because I refused to be seen in um, in Atlanta where I knew inevitably they would do another CT scan. And I've right. had so many on my head at this point, I didn't want another. You get like magnetic forever well i didn't want more Not radiation just temporarily magnetic so cts have radiation whereas mris are magnets and so they don't have the same you know, effects and so you'd be a glow rod yeah i did not <laughs> want to be a glow rod my brain already had a tumor in it i didn't need more stuff mucking that up right so i barely made it onto a plane my dad was already back in boston at that point i told him you know pick me up we're going straight to the hospital my my whole team at MGH was alerted I was coming How old in. are you during all this? At this point now, I was older. I, oh, I don't know, seven years ago. So can I do math? 28? It was 28? Right. Not the kind of stuff that happens to a normal 28-year-old. No, of course not. Yeah, it was terrible. They just first thought I had the flu. But then they couldn't figure out like what the tumor was doing. They scanned it, and it was four times the size that it originally was. So fun hadn't been chilling it hadn't been chilling so between the year prior and in that point it uh it was indulging it grew but then they did all sorts of tests i mean you know seeing if i was leaking spinal fluid all this kind of stuff because they just couldn't quite explain it but and then they finally said whoa wait a minute let's take her seriously she probably does have something real <laughs> yeah and then lo and behold Lo and behold, they said, you know, I think this should come out. It's just <laughs> taking up your your important brain space. Doesn't I, belong there. I had to make room for more smarts and things that I was going to learn along the way. So I had to take out that little bit. Well, there's all like what they filled the hole with. And I say ram chips. <laughs> I like to think it just, you know, opened it up so I could go learn more things. Yeah. <laughs> gave me a little bit of extra space for awesomeness. Exactly. Cash. More cash. <laughs> just stuffed it up there. Can I go back to one interesting little detail sure the act of walking from the basement to the first floor was excruciating oh yeah but then you went on to say that you got on an airplane i know it was and so rough what was that like cabin pressure it was yeah it was it was terrible. i mean honestly i took the and in retrospect i'm not exactly sure how my family who's very overprotective let this happen but <laughs> i i took the train from like you know they have kind of a commuter rail from my uncle's house to 
um, to the airport by myself. And I like almost had to get off to vomit because I was it was so painful. I was like and I did end up vomiting when I at different points from the pain. But that is a 28 year old thing to do on occasion. <laughs> yeah, so you me. had one normal experience. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so it was it was bad. I mean, I barely even remember it from there. But I remember getting off and like just so painful, like my eyes were swollen shut type too painful and like tearing up that I thought I had like the flu or something because I just looked miserable. But it was I was miserable, but from a different source. Oh, was there any one point where you really wanted to just like like grab someone's neck and shake them and say take me seriously i mean i've been wanting to do that my entire life <laughs> i mean as somebody growing up with arthritis right which is a quote-unquote old person's disease by most people's account i've been trying to convince people that there's something wrong with me my whole life not my parents not my family they get it but you know growing up as the sick kid, but you don't look sick. So yeah, you look great. There's nothing visibly wrong with me. Right. So, Stop complaining. Other people have it so much worse. Yeah. It just I mean, and even just again, not believing that there could possibly be anything wrong dealing right. with you're dealing with your friends, your peers, your teachers, your coaches. I was a dancer. I you know, had to explain days that I couldn't do it. And, you know, there were certain people that believed you and were your champions. But it was very hard for me to talk about. I mean, I remember there were times that I would be tearing up if I would be you know, asked to talk about it because I just was so uncomfortable being singled out as the person that something's wrong with. Right. So I was the one that just wasn't normal. But in some ways now, as I've gotten older and I work with all these different patients who have been diagnosed later in life, mm -hmm. with whatever it is, it's a very different experience than what I experienced where I've always been sick. Right. So I didn't have a normal life. And then born this way. Yeah. I mean, essentially, I don't remember anything prior to that. So I didn't have something that was like normal and then life changed. Right. Life has changed, but not because of any like one diagnosis. I've always been on a bumpy ride. Right. And it's not like there's a contest of like the the battle inside you of all the rare things that are competing for your love. I know. <laughs> it's uh yeah, it's been interesting. So that's what like even though I have so many different diagnoses, I usually just always relate it back to the arthritis, the juvenile arthritis, since that was my first diagnosis. And then I mean, who even knows how they're all related, right? Just there's so many comorbidities that I don't know. And they just sometimes need to slap some diagnoses on you for coding purposes right. just to get treatment. Right, exactly. So. There, I'll make a random pop culture reference if any Simpsons people are listening. There's an episode where Mr. Burns <laughs> is dying. They cram all and all of the comorbidities that he has are represented by plushies going through a tiny door that Smithers has to open and they get crammed in the door. And it is this homeostasis of crammed comorbidity plushies that keeps him alive. Yeah. And he says he's indestructible. <laughs> That's what I remember exactly that. And I remember watching that and being like, that That's is me. my life. They made a cartoon a graphic yes. about me. Yeah. So. It's, yeah. So that's your life at 28 years old. So, yeah. So, you know, so be it. And then I I had the surgery and that was seven years ago today. How long are you in the hospital for that? Not long. Under a week. It wasn't too bad. Um, was it exactly what they thought it was? No. Okay. Of course not. Of uh, course not. So they when they got in there, um, it's different. Um, and then even so, it took about a month or so to even get a biopsy result. Cause a it got, month? It sent, got sent around to so many different people because they just couldn't come up with a definitive diagnosis of wow. what the heck this was. Um, so, yeah, I mean, verdict's still kind of out on what exactly it was, but it hasn't grown back. What do they think? What was the 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 rough conclusion that they thought it might be uh, a, a consensus if you would a craniopharyngioma oh wow okay so the more syllables the better by the way. yeah so yeah but it hasn't grown back it did really wreak some havoc on my life for the next like 18 months or so afterwards i just got really sick i mean my body had my brain had been mucked up so right. my body just like couldn't regulate things i do have like gait issues no, no gait issues outside of my normal arthritis issues. Right. Um, but no, it was more I developed diabetes insipidus, which is where your body can't concentrate its urine correctly. So I would have to swing back and forth between trying to drink as much fluid as I could to then not being allowed to have any fluid whatsoever just to try to get my sodium levels correct so that I didn't have a heart attack. But then that ultimately resolved itself. But then I just was super sick. Like I became besties with my infectious disease doctor here at NYU because I just got so sick all the time. And that time I was tested for literally the bubonic plague, 
Legionnaire's disease, HIV, all sorts of different things. Is they're like, this just doesn't happen to normal people. Right. So I was given Robitussin for what ultimately was brain cancer amidst these six months of we don't know what's wrong with Matt when I was a, a college senior. And literally, this was not meant to ever be a joke in my life, but I was told by campus services that it's probably all just in my head. Yeah. That's literally, a, I thought I was making a great joke about that, that it was in my head. Yeah. And then I went into the, the you know, doctor's office in at MGH. And of course, I wasn't the first person that had thought of that. So yeah. they had like a whole binder of like pamphlets called, it was like, it's not just in your head. Right. It's like, they're good. And there you go. So if you were, yeah. if you had a robotus of a brain cancer moment amongst your sea of misdiagnoses, would Legionnaire's disease be part of that? I mean, I guess it just, but bubonic plague though i think that might be a a, a a cake topper i know and that's because they thought because i was out in oregon where apparently there are a lot of like moles or was it groundhog some some little rodent some dirt faring rodent yes yeah, some okay. sort of marmot of sorts <laughs> a marmot. Some marmot and apparently said marmots will carry that and so because i was so sick and they were like maybe you picked up the bubonic plague so Sounds way, to me like your humors were imbalanced. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Something was I've awry. never said the word marmot on any podcast I've ever done ever in 15 Can years. Can we get a little sound effect? Marmot. I'll throw it in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It might have been the sound effect. <laughs> <laughs> but so that's my, my brain surgery story. So when I found the rest of my life to be oddly um, unpredictable, at 22 years old and I had no immediate path, I had this wish that there was some way to sort of rehabilitate back to what I had lost. But then you're in a situation where you've grown up in a, in, in a, with a bunch of things that are defining who you are as a person out there, but then they take a piece of your brain out. Was that an additional pivot for you to find whatever normal meant to you at that point? That's a good question. I mean, I don't know. That's what's so bizarre is the brain surgery, while traumatic, it was more that it just like got in the way. Right. But Speed I've, bump. But I've been dealing with that. That's what like you learn how to be resilient. I was in the middle of doing my PhD, it was actually towards the end, trying to write my dissertation. My well, I shouldn't throw anybody under the bus, but it was challenging <laughs> to communicate why I was out. Um, yeah, your own personal Voldemort. It was, yeah, it was, uh, it was challenging. I was trying to finish that, but hey, patients are resilient. That's what I attributed to. I went back and I went back with a vengeance, and I finished my PhD faster than anybody else had done in our department because I was like, I'm moving on. So that's just kind of how I've approached life. I'm. It's funny now that I have my own company. I've realized a lot of things that when people tell me something can't be done, I am absolutely going to go and do it because I am driven by no's. The best thing somebody can do is tell me no. And then that's what fuels me. I've been having that my whole life. I mean, I had arthritis, was told back in the 80s when I was diagnosed, don't move, don't do anything like you're going to hurt yourself. Just don't move. Don't be active. But my parents, because they wanted to just get me out of the house where all the other kids in my neighborhood played soccer or did gymnastics, they enrolled me in dance. So then I went on to become a professional dancer because I was like, of course I will. Because they said you couldn't. Because they said I couldn't. They told me I shouldn't be, you know, so aggressive with my academics that I should be realistic, that my health couldn't go up and down and shouldn't try for too, too much. Don't fill that hole in your brain with too much wisdom. Don't fill that. So then I was like, well, I'll get a PhD then. Yes. So I'm just, I think that that's where I'm very defined by that, that my conditions, whatever they might be, disease, autoimmune diseases, brain tumors, what have you, it's just another way for me to prove that they're not going to hold me back. The moral of the story being never tell anyone they can't do something. Or please tell me that I can't do it because then I will. So, right. so the more more people who want to tell me no, go for it. Have they told you, Andrew, um, that your son Henry can never do things now because of his bone marrow transplant? That is not something that we have encountered. I think that there has been a push, a conscious push on the part of me and my wife, Andrea, to get Henry out there, to let him pursue his interest to the greatest degree possible. 
there was the tiniest little blip of a gap in his time on the various baseball teams that he participates mm. in, for example. Right up until a couple of days before he went into the hospital, before he got his hair cut prior to the initiation of the chemotherapy, Henry was on the baseball field. And he said goodbye to everybody, and he said he'd see them in a little while. Henry's tough, and he's very proud of how tough he is. The impact of an experience like this on one's identity, if one makes it through, can be very positive. It seems to have been for you. It is for me. And I think that this is something I identify now in our work at Savvy is that this horrible things can happen to people and it can go either way. For some people, it is genuinely horrible and there is no silver lining. And I yes. don't think that any of us need to try to project a silver lining onto people. No. That's for them to understand. Well, hope is self-defined. P hmm. Yeah, people will approach that in different ways and see value or detriment to what they're going through. And both are valid experiences. What we do at Savvy is help those patients or loved ones essentially give meaning and purpose to what they went through. We want to give them opportunities to share their experiences with companies or innovators so that those companies and professionals can learn from those patient experiences. And what we found is that it's it's so meaningful and impactful for patients to be able to use their crappy experiences for good. Mm. And because I'm the academic by training, let's nerd out for a second. We actually... Dr. Harnjeff, <laughs> you have a telephone call at the front desk. <laughs> yes, we actually know that having a sense of purpose reduces healthcare utilization, improves health outcomes. And so we are doing that in our own little way that people can share those experiences in a way that feels good to them. So, you know, they might not be stopping and creating a career out of it like I did, but they might be able to take a survey or get on the phone with a company and share their experiences. And we get feedback from those patients that go, you know, it was really great to talk about this. Nobody's ever asked me these questions. I've never thought about my experiences in those kind of ways. And it's just such an outlet for them because it's a lot to hold on to on your own. Back with our guest after the break. Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, twice-monthly coaching calls, co-workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. So after they told you you'd never be a dancer, that you'd never be a doctor, did anyone tell you you'd never be an entrepreneur? Well, I don't think anybody thought I would be an entrepreneur. I never had any training for it. But the biggest thing I get no's about is that we are a cooperative. So we are taking a very different approach to entrepreneurship. And that is to create a tech platform that is collectively owned by its users. It's known as a platform cooperative. And we are a, you know, a large scalable company that has decided to already give away our ownership. That is not something that most entrepreneurs do. And so we've had lots of venture capitalists who have been interested and they say, look, if you could just not be a cooperative, we're going to give you tons of money. Right. And I'm like, nope. And so that's what I've been doing this now for years. Now people are starting to see and we get recognized for the model because it is so different, but people didn't think it could work and now they see it can and it is. How soon after your postdoctorate and your, I would say chapter 47 of your life started to begin, <laughs> did you realize that there was a, I will say an entrepreneurial pursuit at hand that hadn't yet been conceived of when you realized I can make other people's lives suck a little less and I can make a dent in the universe because that needs to happen. Well, when I think back to things, 
I've always had that quote unquote entrepreneurial spirit. I've been building things for a long time, just not in other companies. I've been very involved in patient communities and advocacy organizations, building programs for those patients for a long time. So I've been a leader in those communities. It's just evolved into finally seeing, I need to come out of the nonprofit world and need to create a standalone entity that we work with patients across all conditions. So that's why this couldn't be housed under one patient advocacy group. It needed to be something that could you know, stand by itself. So how long after I finished my PhD? Not long, because it uh, it just became so apparent to me on the professional side that I had a seat at the table. Because I had a PhD, yet at the same time, you do not need a PhD to share your patient experience. But, you know, I'm an FDA advisor. I sit on their committees. And it's because I have a PhD and can, you know, understand the science mumbo jumbo. But It doesn't have to be me. It could be any patient that is able to articulate their experiences. So it was when companies or innovators or my, you know, research colleagues in academia kept coming to me to share that patient perspective, and they kept coming back. They would say, hey, Jen, you're a patient. You know, we weigh in on this project or that committee. And when it became so apparent that they did not have access to other patients, that was my like aha moment of, Okay, let's let's get you guys connected with some other people because I was already involved in all these patient communities. I would just, you know, post on my Facebook or whatever it is. Hey, anybody else want to weigh in on this? And that's when I was flooded by patients who wanted to contribute. And they're like, oh, I'll do it. I'll do it. But they had no idea that these opportunities were out there. There was no streamlined way for them to find them because oftentimes it's either the low hanging fruit, people like myself, kind of the leaders that had a seat at the table who were being asked. But I'm white with a PhD and live in New York City. I'm not representative of everybody with my condition. Correct. So that was kind of the impetus to playing matchmaker. And when I got all these patients and caregivers that wanted to share their experience, I needed to operationalize it. So I was like, oh, fill out this form. And then it just started taking shape of, okay, well, now we have kind of a system. This is not unique to any one health condition. So how can we create a platform? that makes it so easy and seamless for these innovators connect directly with these diverse patients for whatever those opportunities are, surveys, focus groups, user testing, you know, different opportunities like a podcast, just all of these opportunities to share their experience. And that's how it took off. My my perspective after running Stupid Cancer for all all the years that I did is that industry perceives the end user traditionally as the doctor. And yet, the patient is being leveraged as an unwitting end user to help industry talk to doctors. And that loop doesn't close. Well, I think what makes healthcare so unique, and let me back up and say, when I tell people outside of healthcare what I do, they look at me like I have a thousand heads because they don't understand how this doesn't exist. Right. Like, isn't it obvious that you would talk to the end user, because every other consumer industry does that. But in healthcare, there are too many stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And the person, if I'm buying a car, I will go and I will look at said car. I will then buy said car and I will then drive said car. Well, you could also listen to what other people think of said car. Yeah, you have choices, but you're the decision maker, you're the purchaser, and you're the user. In healthcare, those are all different people or different stakeholders. You have providers that are the ones who decide what you use, the healthcare insurance companies that are the ones who pay for that, and then those lowly patients who are the ones that actually have to use it. And that's so important because we're throwing all this money into innovations and we get all the way down to the road and then they hit the market and patients are expected to use them and they either are too cumbersome to use they don't make a meaningful impact, impact. They have too many side effects. They don't integrate with other things in their lives. And that's why they fail. So we just wasted all this time and money creating things that should never have been on the market in the first place. All they had to do was ask patients, but they didn't. Right. It's it's The tech is only as good as the people that know it exists to take advantage of it and can afford it and have access to it. And the tech's only as good as if it solves a meaningful problem. Right. That's so many people in the tech industry are coming into healthcare and A, they don't understand 
the complexity of healthcare. I'm excited they're here because they're moving things faster and they understand iterative design. But we just need to say, you know, healthcare is predominantly a B2B to C play, business to business to consumer. And so from that standpoint, they usually just talk the B2B part. They only right. talk to who's mm -hmm. going to pay for it and they forget somebody else has to use it. And then when it hits the market again, they're like, oh, that's weird. Nobody, nobody likes my product. Yeah. There's a great video that you made explaining the, the idea behind and the structure of Savvy Co-op. Uh, you used puppets to tell the story. I well, love I it. Yes, I did. That's how I met her, by the way. She came to Stupid Cancer with her puppets and, yes. and, and everything jump started from there. Yeah. So people should look it up. We can probably throw a link up, right? Yes. But there's an element in that's covered there and elsewhere, of course, that, that we haven't talked about yet. And that is, you know, when you compare Savvy as a tech platform to platforms such as, well, Facebook or uh, others, what's happening there is that uh, on Facebook, people are sharing their data at no charge, and that data is being sold to other people, and the people providing the data are not benefiting from it. That is not quite the case on Savvy Co-op, is it? No, that's not the case. We believe that the patients are the ones doing the work, providing the insights. So that's why we gave them ownership in the company. I mean, truly, when I set out to start Savvy and realizing that what we did was a, a for-profit type endeavor, it did not sit right with me to build a company that was going to profit off of my peers. I am very much identified as a patient. And so that didn't feel right. And that's why I ended up stumbling into, well, this could be a cooperative because then anything that the patient is generating can be contributed back to them. So as a co-op, members have a vote in what we do and they share in our profits. They earn dividends based on their contributions. So that can be through sharing data. It can be participating in these different gigs and opportunities. It could be recruiting members. Anything that's contributing to the co-op, they are then we're tracking that in patronage points so that at the end of the year, we would redistribute our profits back to them equitably. So that's where other companies, they're taking that data that patients are supplying and they're then selling it and they're making money. And the patients are A, not making money and they're the ones with the medical bills stacked up and filing bankruptcy. So we're trying to level the playing field here by creating a more equitable situation. I can't think of another platform even in any, any other industry that does something similar. But that's probably, it's probably not true that you're, you're the only company doing something like this. There is a movement around trying to apply this cooperative model to other tech platforms. We have sort of trailblazed a little bit beyond it because for many of them, they're up against incumbents. So there are other co-ops that are taking on Uber or Airbnb so that the the drivers or the renters are the ones who have ownership in the platform. But as you can see that that's a, it's an uphill battle to then go up against one of those big incumbents. We're kind of creating the space, but doing it in a way that equitably values the people that we're serving. One of the hot button issues that I've been, as you know, like really railing against the, especially the event industry is that if shit happens to you and then you become a valuable commodity to some company to make money off of you deserve compensation and every time that i've been asked or stupid cancer was asked or someone in our community had been asked we need you on this panel so everyone in attendance gets a perspective great here's how much it costs to pay us to give you people or to pay me to sit on your panel or to get this idea of compensating people who are of value to you should be a no-brainer to industry. And yet we've been so decommodified by all of this that they just expect us to show up and give them what they want for free. Well, absolutely. And I've heard every different perspective and excuse for why one doesn't pay patients. No budget. No budget certainly is one of them. And we're working on that. But I think one of the things is a, people think that this should all come out of altruism. Right. And the issue around this is that it is perpetuating a diversity issue. That if we are only going to include people that can afford to take time off of work and to come in and to be able to pay for their own childcare or whatever is needed, that is going to 
drastically change the the amount of people that could be able to participate. And so if we truly want to innovate for all, we need to, you know, set the budget aside and so do the work to make that happen. I think one of the other things that I certainly heard a lot around my my academic work around committees, right? That, oh, well, you know, patients shouldn't be paid to be part of this committee because the doctors and the epidemiologists and whomever else are not being paid. Yes, but they're there professionally. They have jobs. They it's have, their job to be there. Their salaries are going to cover this. And it may be part of their professional advancement that they are there. It looks good on their CV, whatever that might be. If I work at TJ Maxx and I have to take time off to go share my heart failure story. Not a sponsor. It, yes, not a sponsor. <laughs> using an example that it's just going to be a different situation. And if we don't recognize that, then the people that are the ones saying they can't do it, they don't truly want to be patient centered. Should there be a national patient day rate movement? There's a lot going around about what is fair market value. And we deal with this all the time with our pharmaceutical clients who have their own fair market value that they have, and it's very hard to change it. We are fortunate enough to have a seat at the table to to change the conversation around what is equitable. I'll give you an example. We had one opportunity where a pharmaceutical company wanted patients of a certain population to share their uh, disease, talk about their patient experience of a very stigmatizing condition via video that would be used on their website. Now, that would only take a couple hours to film, sure, but the value that they're getting for that evergreen content for a pharma company to have on their website to go make money, that has a different value. And so we were able to push back and say, no, this is not just going to be you know, $200 for that. We need to really make sure these patients are equitably valued for what they're bringing to your company. And they said, okay, help us understand. And we were, and they ended up getting paid thousands of dollars instead. And that's what is equitable. It's not going to be anybody's full-time job to share their patient experience, but it should be equitable. Am I a broken record yet? We need to be equitable when we think about what patients bring to the table. And bravo for that, because it really is a, look, we need more patient leaders to be on this side of pushing industry. I'm going to, because you are involved with the FDA, uh, as as I, I've done so many ODAC meetings and patients deserve this and deserve this, you probably are familiar with the Sunshine Act, which before it existed, we can put a link to that in the episode description. The Sunshine Act was supposed to do a whole bunch of nice things. It wound up, you know, curtailing industry bloat and, you know, things that didn't necessarily need to happen, you know, doctor conferences in Aruba and buying people cars and things like that. Clearly not okay for industry influence. But I feel, and I want your thoughts on this, that what it really did was push it so far to the right that it went up prohibiting the pharma companies from truly seeing lower risk in patient influence. I think there's certainly a combination of that because that's an example of compensating patients. Um, so they're concerned about the compliance around what happens. Are they biasing patients, right. et cetera? But again, I'm used to that criticism. But I think the other issue is around regulations that pharmaceutical companies are concerned that they're doing direct-to-consumer marketing if they talk to patients. Right. This is not the case. No. And the FDA says that you need to engage patients, but they don't go as far to tell people how. And so our work in the industry, we work with a number of pharmaceutical companies and We've talked to all of them. So I can tell each person coming from a different company where their company sort of falls on the spectrum of risk aversion. It is a spectrum. It is. And we kind of internally think about it as those who are innovation forward and those who are innovation proof. Mm -hmm. Because the, <laughs> the ones who are innovation proof, they're slow going to, you know, get up to speed here. But we truly believe that this is a smart business decision. If you're not talking to patients, you're going to make just products and services that are not going to serve people the way they should they should not have the high they won't have the highest impact so those people who are innovation proof at those companies that are afraid to talk to patients in this kind of way where they're just sharing their experiences they're going to be the ones that are left behind and it's one thing for the fda to say you should be doing this but it's another thing to enact policies that relax the restrictions that give the lawyers diarrhea to talk to us yeah it's um 
it's it's interesting and we've done a lot and there are many a times i am brought onto phone calls with compliance etc to explain no they're they're just gonna ask patients about their experiences the pharma team is not doing the interviews they're not the ones that are going to be talking about their product they just want to know what is it like to have breast cancer or right. whatever it might yeah. be just you could read that on a blog but you could also get that uh you know in in different other formats so it's definitely still something that the industry is getting used to but we see that this is not going away if you want to call yourself patient-centered you have to do the work you have to put the budget behind it you have to have compliance on board with figuring out ways that work for everybody within their team to connect with patients this is why we see digital health moving faster because they don't have the same concerns that different they, lawyers and different lawyers but you know i understand the the pharma and biotech industry do come at it and, and medical devices it, it is a little bit different for them than some of these other products and services that are coming out so in terms of your vision and your growth because you clearly are a visionary with a very unique perspective uh within the radar of, of you know the crappiness of <laughs> the, the human experience of going through the shit happens store yes you should be paid a fair market value for your contributions to someone else making a profit off your shit happens but at the same time evolving the way that the human experience plays into actually translating to what we're ideally helping them do. If you don't know it exists and you can't get to it and you can't afford it, that's a whole other show. Yeah. But at the end of the day, what is your aspiration? Whew. Well, I have a lot of aspirations and I can tell you some of my- Pick the top 40. God, also, top 40. also, you may not succeed in any of them. Yes. I'm telling you that right now as a favor. This is, I appreciate that. <laughs> it's the least we can do. Uh, exactly. I see what you're doing. I'm going to go do all 40. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I, I truly just want the industry to come to a place where they see the value of what patients bring and they do equitably value them. That's what- Savvy's purpose is, is to create a space for people to use their experiences to create a positive change and be valued for it. So that's where when patients participate in the different gigs that we offer, not only can they be earning dividends if they're part of our cooperative, but they get paid right there on the spot. So we want them to get paid for that. I think perhaps some of my uh, controversial opinions about where I would like to see the world go in the healthcare industry specifically is I would love a day when patients who participate in clinical trials have equity in that drug, they have put their bodies on the line for this company to learn from them and have who knows what happens. And yet, sometimes we even don't even follow up with them. We don't thank them. We don't let them know that the trial has shut down. We don't share the data or the results with them. So we have a long way to go to get there. But I think about my friends who were in some of the blockbuster drug trials because I have autoimmune diseases. So all the fancy biologic medications where they see the commercials of people running through fields all happy. It's always a weed field. It's Why always, is it always a weed field? It's always fields and people smiling and hugging and, you know. Maybe. Dancing to some, you know. Exactly. But those medications are very successful. Yes. You could set aside a, even a tiny equity pool for those patient participants, not subjects, but the people who participated in the trials and have them share in the upside. Like uh, that would be beautiful. So that's but, one of my controversial opinions. So when we start doing more shows on what the hell is a trial and they should rename it to like enhanced interrogation, <laughs> there's got to be a better word for it. We're going to do a lot of shows on, on just the, how do you deconstruct this, I'm not a guinea pig. And I, I love the incentivization model because yes, clearly if you're donating your time and your data and your biology, your body to someone else's future experience to benefit from, yes, why the hell not? Yes. So let's see how we can do it. But we got to practice what we preach. So that's what Savvy started with ourselves. Like a Michael Jackson song, Man in the Mirror. Man in the Mirror. Man in the Mirror. So we're, we're making that change here first and sharing equity with our members. And hopefully we can keep driving the conversation so people can see that you can run a successful business and be profitable and do the right thing. So as we wrap, there are clearly lots of people listening to the show that are patients that are either in or out of the shit happens store. What's the best way for them to learn about your offering 
how to join the cooperative and what they should expect. Well, they should first start by going to our website, Savvy.coop, and that is S-A-V-V-Y dot C-O-O-P. And there you can learn a little bit more about what we do. That's a place for both patients, certain caregivers, as well as companies or innovators to go and find out more information and sign up. Um, then they can expect to get a weekly newsletter from us as well, where they will get all our new opportunities. They're also there posted straight on the platform so everybody can see them. We believe in open and democratic processes so that everybody has an opportunity to apply. And then they get involved. They can start participating in gigs and getting paid for their experience. What a great idea. We're excited that we're still here and going strong and that uh, more patients and companies are seeing the value and bringing the two sides together. Well, Jen Harnjeff, uh, thanks for stopping by again for the second time. You will be hearing a lot more from her and to be continued. Sounds great. Thanks for having me. Okay. Bye, everyone. That's all for today, folks. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, follow us on social, and tell all your friends to listen. Out of Patience with Matthew Zachary is a product of Offscript Media. Our executive producer is Matthew Zachary. Our senior producers are Jen Horanjeff and Andrew McDowell. Darren Tun is our production intern. It is recorded, mixed, and edited by Matthew Zachary. Our theme music is by the Mike Van Allen Quintet and by Mara. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscript.com. Hit us up at contact at offscript.com to share comments, feedback, and make guest recommendations. For more information, visit offscript.com.